And welcome back to Hunger Games Chronicles for the 131st to 135th Hunger Games. We are one sub away from 150, so if you want to subscribe, please go ahead. It's free and you can always change your mind at any time if my content doesn't satisfy you. Anyways, thank you for tuning in once again. Let's dive in. The 131st game took place in the year 153 in an oak forest, featuring impulsive cows, an earthquake and a tree fall, and lasting for 10 days. This year's games gave hope to future tributes and reminded viewers that even if someone lacks brawn, they do not always lack the brains. This year's victor was a 14-year-old from District Tree named Corden Harper. Corden pretended to be an extremely weak tribute during the training that occurred before the games began, and almost all of the tributes believed him, due to his tiny build and young age. When the gong sounded, he fled the cornucopia and ran into the nearby forest, which made capital viewers scoff in amusement. However, Corden looked around to make sure that nobody was following him, and viewers were puzzled about what he was planning to do, but, as, but then Cor he ran back into the cornucopia. He later revealed that as he pretended to be an extremely weak tribute, he knew the couriers would try to kill him, one body part after another, and so he had ki fled the cornucopia, and then had run inwards again so that the couriers would now be killing the stronger threats. This turned out to be a genius idea, as the couriers were all attacking the more muscular tributes, giving Corden the opportunity to steal a bowl of soup and a metal bottle of water from the cornucopia before, before fleeing once more. He didn't look back as he ran and drank some of the water, while the couriers finally noticed him. However, he narrowly avoided them and put a large amount of distance between himself and the careers by the time it was night, night, the night of day two, as he did not look back and spent all of the first day and night as well as the second day trying to escape them. He was exhausted, but the elderly Rubius Dalton pull, pulled up his identity file and revealed to viewers that Corden worked a night shift in, elec in an electrical engineer company, engineering company, and this answered viewers' questions about how Corden did not manage to sleep in two days. He then decided to return to the cornucopia, muttering that he had seen something there. Although it would take another two days to return to the cornucopia, Corden persisted and made it to the cornucopia. However, no, no, he noticed that Argus from 2 was snoring on the table inside of the cornucopia. Argus's snores amused the audience but scared Corden, and he snuck up from behind instead. Corden glanced around, and viewers tried to see what he was looking for, but then the cameras focused on a small test tube with a purplish liquid in it. He then glanced at the oak trees and at some of the flowers growing there, which made several scientists in the capital gasp as they realized what Corden was trying to do, but they did not say anything. Corden took a deep breath and glanced at the snoring Argus, then at the other five careers. He scoffed, before turning to the cameras and whispering that the career should have left someone with the night watch although it appeared pretty clear that Argus had fallen asleep during his watch. Corden then ran inwards and grabbed a test tube before turning and running. Argus jumped to his feet and shouted out, but Corden didn't look back and continued running, clasping the tube in his hand, while tur but finally turned around to see Gladia from 2 glaring at him and berating Argus for his stupidity. He continued sprinting back into the forest and glanced back at the plants, before bending down and realizing that most of the plants in this forest were edible, due to his training in the survival station during the training that occurred during before, the week before. He then examined a small tube, before pouring a tiny amount of its content on top of several plants, which caused them to make a small fizzing sound. Corden grinned before climbing up a tree and hiding, while capital viewers who were not scientists in the field of genetics remained unaware of what Corden was doing and confused about how this test tube would help him win the games. Corden stayed in the tree before hearing a pair of tributes approaching. Sorkin and Julie, both from Six, suddenly entered the clearing that was below the tree Corden was hiding in. They glanced at each other before beginning to eat the cow that they had killed. They grinned at each other and after finishing their meal, Sorkin burped, which made Julie, Julie frown and scowl at him. Julie then reached for some more of the cow, but Sorkin vomited, saying the cow was horrible. Julie sneered back at Sorkin, telling him that she had cooked the cow, and Sorkin glanced around and said exactly, which amused viewers but did not amuse Julie. She told Sorkin he could cook his own food, but Sorkin vomited again, telling Julie he needed to purge himself of the poison that Julie had cooked, which made us out, sound, shout obscenities at him. She grabbed a knife, but Sorkin grinned, asking her if she really wanted to kill her muscular and 
Rather macho, district partner. Julie snarled as Sorkin continued describing himself as admiring and handsome before she pushed him outside to vomit. It was at this moment that Julie noticed the plants that Corden had dropped the liquid on. As Sorkin left to urinate and vomit, she smiled and whispered that she was going to eat without him, and she approached the plants. She had practiced along, alongside Corden at the yes, survival station during training and realized that the plants were edible before grabbing them and eating some of them. Sorkin returned to the clearing a few minutes, seconds later, and noticed Julie stuffing her face with the plants. He shouted at her to give him some food, and she spun around, shrieking. Sorkin scoffed before punching her in the face and shouting at her to give him some of the plants. Julie asked him to get them if he wanted them, and Corden grinned up from up the tree. Sorkin snarled and snatched some plants before stuffing them in his mouth and sticking his tongue out at Julie, who once again sneered back at him. The pair from six continued arguing while Corden winced from the tree. Sorkin and Julie then began a physical altercation, leading to Sorkin throwing Julie to the ground. Corden scoffed, and as the tributes from Six continued fighting, he ran inwards and grabbed some of their water. He got ready to flee, muttering that his plan did not work, but then noticed Julie beginning to cough. She started off coughing slowly, but then Sorkin's face was splattered with blood as Julie continued coughing. Sorkin shouted at Julie to stop coughing, but Corden grinned, whispering that the plan had worked. Julie continued coughing blood and leaning on Sorkin, who shouted at her to get off. Sorkin then slapped Julie before stepping backwards as he suddenly heard a giggle. He glanced around to see Argus and Gladia running towards him, with Gladia quickly stabbing Julie in the neck, although her cannon had already sounded. Sorkin took on Argus and put on a strong fight, but then coughed blood as well, giving Argus time to snap his neck. Some scientists attempted to explain what had happened, but a professor of genetics at the Capital Academy, Zeus Cardew, stating that while some plants were edible, such as the ones at the arena, they had several different genes implanted into them, which in, were in this case genes which made the plants grow faster. Cardio then explained that whilst this was beneficial to the tribute, some of these genes could be activated by an activating agent and turn bad, causing the plant to become poisonous. He then explained that he had asked his sister, head game maker Maya Cardio, to place a bottle of activating agent into Carnicopia to see which tribute would activate the extra gene. With that, capital citizens app- applauded for Cordain, but at that moment, he was still stuck in his tree, but were climbing down as the careers left. After the success of his plan, Corden appeared to have more confidence and continued whispering that he could win the games. He then followed the careers as they continued killing more tributes, whilst also making sure not to lose the tube filled with the remaining of the remainders of the activating agent. Activating agent. He noticed that the careers always seemed to be looking for an excuse to kill each other due to a disagreement in the training center, which Corden had observed from the survival station. On the seventh day, Argus and Gladia became intimate next to a tree, while Honor and Alexandria, both from one, knelt on a tree and ate some bread. Corden realized how easy it would be to start a fight between the careers, and so when Argus and Gladia began kissing, and Honor and Alexandria got distracted by Honor burning his sword in a fire, Corden snuck up from behind and stole one of Alexandria's knives, as well as a loaf of bread and the remaining two bottles of water. He then turned and ran, and after he fled, Argus and Gladia requested some water, and Honor turned around to pass a bottle to them. He then replied that the balls were gone, and Argus pinned him to the ground, snarling, like, What do you mean, gone? Argus's treatment of Honor had enraged Alexandria, and she threw another knife at his head, which sounded as cannon. Honor and Gladia then engaged in a duel, but ultimately Honor managed to pummel Gladia to death with a nearby tree branch. Corden grinned, happy that the careers had turned on each other, stating that he was mainly happy that Honor and Alexandria had eliminated Argus and Gladia, who were the largest threats in the arena. Corden then spent night seven hiding at the top of a bushy tree that was near to the camp of the District One tribute, while the pair decided they would travel on the eighth day. Corden made a brave decision to follow them as they killed tribute after tribute, b- before stopping towards midday in order to eat. As Honor slaughtered a cow and, they be- and began to cook some of its meat, Muffet from eight stumbled into the clearing and tried to steal some of the meat, although Honor quickly chased her and within a minute, he and Alexandria had caught up with her and he snapped her neck. This, however, gave Corden an opportunity, and so he ran after the soup that was cooking and poured some of the activating agent into it, but were turning and running. Neither Honor nor Alexandria felt that anything was amiss when they began to slurp their broth, with Honor complimenting Alexandria for her fine culinary skills to which she jokingly fanned herself and then affectionately kissed Honor, her, him grinning in delight. Corden scoffed from a few meters away and watched from inside a bush 
as Honor's arm suddenly began twitching. Alexandria asked him if he was okay as he began twitching underground and coughing blood. He then shouted that someone had poisoned him and wished Alexandria the best of luck and told her to vomit out what she had eaten. Alexandria immediately forced herself to vomit and continued to spew the brothel over the ground, whilst Cordon sprinted inwards and grabbed Honor's sight. He shouted a warning at Alexandria as she spun around, before throwing a knife at Cardin's shoulder, which caused him to scream in agony. Cardin turned and ran as Honor continued twitching until he stopped convulsing and his cannon sounded, leaving a fuming Alexandria behind. Once the next morning dawned, it was announced that only five tributes remained, and Cardin believed that it would be better for him to go back to the cornucopia, as this would be where the final showdown would take place. But he glanced at the cornucopia from afar and noted that there was nothing special available. He then turned around and ran back to the perimeter instead, arriving in three hours. Cordon had stuck up on the muscular Jose from 14, whose bulging muscles certainly made him a threat to most of the other tributes, with the exception of Alexandria. However, as Cordon was preparing to drop some of the activating agent into Jose's bread, the alert boy from 14 turned around and whacked Cordon on the head, knocking him to the ground. Cordon gasped in pain as Jose licked his lips and stood over him, stating that District 14 would finally get a victory. Corden grinned sadistically at Jose and said, Well, I don't think so, and fought back, kicking Jose in the head. As Jose yelped, Corden grabbed his knife and thrust it into Jose's muscles, causing him to scream even louder. Corden then apologized to Jose before stabbing him in the neck, sounding his cannon instantly. A few hours later, towards the end of day 10, Leon from 10 committed suicide due to his depressed thoughts ever since he had been reaped a few days before his 15th birthday. There's just left, there's left just three tributes remaining, and so game maker Cardio caused a minor earthquake, which caused Alexandria in June from 11 to flee towards the perimeter before a tree fall was then triggered. Alexandria and June both managed to avoid the tree fall, but June's leg was broken. After not hearing a cannon, Alexandria returned to June and snapped her neck, before realizing Corden was the only re- opponent that remained, and she ran towards the perimeter, which made Corden swear in a panic as he heard her approaching. He held his breath as Alexandria walked closer and closer towards him, and she began taunting him, sh- shouting that he, she knew he had killed Honor. Corden then snarled as she approached, contemplating all the possible ways he could kill her. He then noticed his knife and got ready to throw it at her, but Alexandria saw him lunging towards her at the last second and so she tripped him, causing the knife to fly into the force field. It burnt immediately in Corden's war, before getting to his feet and clenching his fist, preparing to fight her. Alexandria continued laughing as Corden prepared to punch her, but then suddenly remembered he still had some activating agent left. He spun around and splashed it into Alexandria's eyes, throwing all the contents out of the tube, emptying it. There was a moment of silence as she stared in shock, but then screamed in pain, falling to the ground and lashing at her eyes, shouting obscenities at Corden, which had to be censored. As she groaned, Corden told her to never underestimate a boy from District 3 before grabbing her own knife and stabbing her in the head, winning the games. After his victory, Corden became an inventor in District 3 and was fondly remembered for how he had not let his small size lose him the games. The 132nd game took place in the year 154 in a tropical swamp. They featured vicious alligators, a blackout, and lasted for six days. The victor of the 132nd Hunger Games was considered to be one of the most favorite victors of all times, due to him having survived the game with the games with a brutal career pack who did not stop hunting him. This year's victor was a 17-year-old from District 5 named Marius Kruitz. Like most years, the career tributes from 1, 2, 4, and 7, and occasionally 12 teamed up during training. However, in a rare move for all the career tributes, they asked Marius if he would like to join their alliance. Being from 5, Marius knew that the careers would turn on him once he was no longer useful, and he politely declined their offer, infuriating them, making them shout they would target him in the arena. Due to the threat of being killed by the careers, Marius decided to only run in a few meters when the gong sounded, in order to grab a bottle of water and a loaf of bread. However, as he was doing so, he was suddenly hit in the back with a knife that had been thrown by Gunnar from 12, which caused him to drop to the ground. Agate from 1, who was the tallest male tribute, quickly began stabbing Marius in the chest repeatedly, making him scream in pain. Marius struggled against Agate before ripping the knife from his own chest, and through his pain, he stabbed Agate so many times in the neck that his head fell off as the hovercraft later retrieved his body. Marius then gasped once more before clutching his chest and fleeing. 
Marius hobbled away, clearly weakened, but unbeknownst to him, he was being followed by Gunnar and the other couriers, who had seen him nearly behead Agate and wanted vengeance. However, they soon decided to rest, and Marius heard Gunnar shouted an alligator to leave the camp. Marius slowly approached the camp before stealing one of Gunnar's arrows. As Gunnar's back was turned, Marius threw the arrow at net from four, which hit his head and sounded his cannon. The others prepared to attack Marius, but Gunnar immediately charged towards him. They had a brief fight during which Marius was stabbed in the leg again, but he quickly gained the upper hand due to a solid build and determination before knocking Gunnar unconscious and throwing him into, into the lagoon, throwing a log after him, which drowned him and his cannon soon sounded. However, despite Marius having killed three of the careers in one day, the remaining careers just still decided to follow him, even though he shouted at them to leave him alone. On the second day, as Marius was observing one of the alligators, Caspia from two jumped from off from one of the trees and onto Marius's back, causing him to shout out in pain and surprise. Caspia pushed Marius to the ground and she tried to kill him, but he shouted out many obscenities that he had learnt in District 5, before muttering that Caspia was making this too easy. As she asked him what he meant, he punched her in the face and pushed her into the lagoon. An, all, an alligator crawled out of the water towards Caspia and she screamed, but Marius swore in annoyance as Caspia kicked him in the face and turned to run, but he quickly knocked her unconscious with his fist. She woke up a few minutes later to see that Marius was slowly lowering her into the alligator's mouth, making her shriek in fear. She called him obscene words, but he did not blink before he threw her into the mouth, her cannon sounding a few m- moments later. This iconic death immediately made Marius a capital favorite, and he was gifted with a lot of bandages and a large box of daggers from sponsors. Despite Marius now having murdered four of the couriers, the remaining four couriers decided to continue following him. Marius realized that they were following him, but decided he would wait until later to act. The couriers continued following him through to day three and four, but only eight tributes remained by the time the sun dawned on day five. Despite sun having just dawned, it soon began vanishing. Marius asked himself if this was an eclipse, but after just 49 seconds, the sun vanished from the sky, causing a complete blackout. Marius took his chance and snarled, before running straight towards the couriers, who were shouting at each other in confusion. Marius tackled the Zoda from one to the ground and snapped her neck, without blinking, before grabbing her sword. As the Zoda's cannon sounded, Reina from four grabbed Marius and pushed him to the ground, although he grabbed the Zora's sword and slit Reina's throat with it, causing her to scream out. She fell to the ground and convulsed for several seconds, which sounded her cannon, whilst Marius then glanced around and wondered who the only remaining couriers were, and these were Prick and Aspen, both from Sevet, both of whom had escaped when the blackout began. Marius correctly guessed that the stubborn couriers would not stop following him, and decided that he would be able to kill them, and so he walked towards the perimeter, pretending that he was looking for other tributes when in reality he was trying to killed Prick and Aspen, but mainly the former, due to him being by far the strongest of all the careers. That same day, Marius noticed Prick and Aspen were approaching him faster with their axes raised, and so he immediately spun around and threw one of his knives at Aspen, causing her to yell as surprise as she tried to remove the knife from her hand. But Marius deserved a well-timed kick to her chest, causing her to yell in pain as she fell to the ground, whilst Prick raised his axe in order to strike Marius. Marius held a hand out to stop the axe and it impaled him in the head but he then snapped Aspen's neck with his legs, amusing the audience and making Marius even more of a favorite. Marius and Prick had a brief fight, but due to Marius' injury, Prick managed to escape. That night, Marius was gifted with more bandages to heal all of his wounds. By day six, Marius was amused as he only had two opponents left. He decided that he would set a trap to kill at least one of his remaining opponents, and he was given some paint by sponsors. He set several wires and led them into the main lagoon, before covering them with leaves and painting them green. Capital viewers realized that he had set a trap with the wires, and he sat down and rested for a few hours until he finally heard a scream. Unbeknownst to Marius, Prick had seen him setting these traps, but did not know what they were for, and so he had begun investigating them. He entered the very center of the trap, making him roar out in pain as he was electrocuted all over his body. He fell to the ground in pain and roared Marius' name, making him grin and he walked towards Prick, who was still groaning, screaming and twitching in pain as he roared Marius' name. Marius jokingly said, Is there a problem? as he glanced at Prick, who was holding his arm in pain. Mm-hmm. However, the shock did not seem to affect Prick overall, as he was on his feet in a few minutes and prepared to face Marius. They circled each other, with Marius lunging towards Prick. However, as he did so, Prick threw a knife at Marius, hitting him in the left eye. 
Marius screamed in agony and he immediately collapsed to the ground, shouting obscenities at Prick. He then opened his functioning eye to see that instead of attacking him, Prick's eyes were darting around as though he was looking for someone. Just then, Astrid from Five ran out from behind a nearby tree and leapt onto Prick's back, making him swear in a panic as he collapsed to the ground. Prick and Astrid then began fighting, and Marius realized that Astrid was his district partner, and he snarled before managing to get to his feet despite the intense pain. He then kicked Prick in the head just as Prick sma- stabbed Astrid in the head. As Astrid's cannon sounded, Marius roared in anger and punched Prick repeatedly, before drowning him for two minutes, sounding his cannon and leaving Marius as the winner. Marius was hailed as a hero in District 5 in the capital for managing to kill eight tributes, all of whom were careers, despite being stabbed in the chest, back, leg, and eye. He was given a purple eye patch for his left eye. His doctors were unable to heal it, but he did not let this stop him and designed radar systems with his mentor, Eddie Greengrass. Although he soon quit his job and became a strong mentor who led several tributes to victory following his games. The 133rd games took place in the year 155 in Ea Lion Caves. They featured mischievous rats, rock falls, and lasted for 13 days. It is strongly believed that Maya Cardio decided to reuse the arena for District 1's district games during the 100 games and simply renamed the arena, which caused Cardio to be criticized for this year. However, this year's arena still saw an amazing spectacle, with many similarities to District 1's games. This year's victim was the 16-year-old from District 8 named Valor Tanner. After she was reaped, the first thing Valor's mentor, Brayden, told her was that she should get used to her surrounding. And so as the countdown began, the first thing Valor did was look around the cornucopia, seeing that she was on a strip of land leading to an island. She saw that behind her, there were arched caves and several diamond rocks, which she decided to aim for. She then saw that there were only pickaxes available inside the cornucopia, and so she aimed for these as well. When the gong sounded, Valor immediately leapt off of her podium and dove into the water, attempting to swim to the cornucopia. Although due to District 8 lacking any nature, Valor was extremely slow, trashing around. At one point, Prize from one who was familiar with this arena due to a relative of his, Optimo Braun, having won in this arena, swam towards Valor and attempted to drown her. But she kicked him in the genitals and he, as he cried out in vain, she grabbed one of his two axes and left him whimpering in the water as she fled. Valor sw- sprinted as fast as she could as soon as she was out of the water before running into one of the caves, noticing that Moves from Six was running ahead of her. Although Moves was not much of a threat, Valor decided that it would make sense for her to kill as many tributes as she could, and so she threw her axe at the back of his head. He let out a grunt and fell to the ground, sounding his cannon seconds later. Valor then stole one of Moves' flashlights and she used it to navigate through the many caves. Slowly towards the end of the night, Valor arrived on a tiny strip of land and set camp there. But as she slept, she suddenly heard a tiny voice saying, Valor, from behind her. Valor jolted around and grinned when she saw that this was her 13-year-old district partner, Cloth. Valor appeared to be generally amused by Cloth, and she asked him if he needed any help. Cloth replied that he had gotten some bread and water from the cornucopia. Valor asked him what he thought of the water in the lake, but he replied that he had watched District 1's Reaping games a few years ago and knew that the water was poisonous. Valor and Clot agreed to start an alliance, and Clot happily shared some of his food with Valor. They drank some water and worked together for the next three days, until Clot tripped and hit his leg on one of the rocks in the water, causing it to bleed, bleed, on the fourth day. Valor managed to staunch the blood with a piece of fabric torn from her shirt, leading to only a few drops of blood hitting the water. Just then, several rats crawled up from the water and towards the blood that had fallen. Cloth screamed and Valor used her axe to quickly kill these rats, before hiding in a nearby cave with Cloth. However, when the rats had made their way towards Cloth, he had panicked and dropped her water bottle, hence causing them to lose their source of hydration, although Va- Valor managed to hide her annoyance with Cloth. As the two of them came to a stop in the cave, a rock suddenly hit Valor in the neck, causing her to cry out as prize and lush, boat from one, leapt out from behind a larger b- boulder. Valor shouted at Cloth to run, but he appeared to be dazed and stood still. Valor managed to throw a diamond at Lush's head before she could behead Cloth, and she screamed, dropping to the ground. Valor and Cloth then ran as fast as they could, with Prize and Lush quickly chasing after them. 
Being taller, Valora ran faster than Cloth, but she threw him over her shoulder as she reached a large pile of diamonds. Price threw an axe at Cloth, hitting him in the leg and causing him to shout in pain, but Valora flicked some of the blood away towards Price, alerting several rats and they crawled towards him. Price swore in a panic and immediately turned to run, but the rats gained on him. However, he managed to fend him off with his other axe, who were climbing up a pillar of rocks with Lush and staying there, distracting them from Valor and Claude, who were climbing the pillar ne- nearest to them. They then reached the top in a few minutes, whilst Valor finally realized that Claude had left his food in the cave they had been hiding in. They became extremely annoyed at their lack of food and dream, but thankfully for them, they were from District 8, where factory workers went long hours without food. Although this gave them a decent experience of hunger and thirst, Valor and Claude struggled to sit at the top of this pillar, but luckily they were out of range of Prize and Lush's axes. However, Prize and Lush did not get down due to rats grouping down at the bottom of the of the pillars. This annoyed the pair, but they still had enough food and water to surprise to survive. Valor foolishly believed that Prize would tell them where they could find fresh water, but when she asked him, Price laughed and told her that he had gotten water from the cornucopia. They remained on the pillar for the next few days as Price and Lush occasionally received sponsor gifts of food, whilst Valor and Claude became malnourished and dehydrated. Price and Lush appeared amused by this, but Valor soon came up with a plan to steal their food and water. As Price slept on the ninth day of the games and Lush kept watch, Valor slowly climbed to the roof of the cave they were in. And due to her practice in the obstacle course during training, she managed to make her way towards Lush by gripping the rocks, without Lush noticing. Just as Valor was about to make a move on Lush, however, Lush jolted around and shouted out, which caused Price to wake up. Valor muttered under her breath and wrapped her, her legs around Lush's neck, while still hanging from the rocks, and despite the intense pain in her hands, Valor managed to jerk her legs to the side, snapping Lush's neck with a loud crack. Lush fell back onto Price, causing him to roar in anger and as he fell from the pillar and hit his head hard on a diamond. But he survived and managed to walk away a little. But Valor then jumped on his back, bringing him to the ground once more. Claude then woke up and ran towards Valor, and he handed her the axe, which she used to kill Prize. Valor became a capital favorite for having killed both Prize and Lush, with the elderly Rubius Dalton, who was in his mid-70s, talking about how iconic Lush's death had been. Valor was hence gifted an adequate amount of bread, cheese and water, which she shared with Clot. As they woke up on day 11, however, game maker Cardio announced that rocks would begin falling from the ceiling of the arena and boulders would roll through the caves, and the only way to avoid these rocks were for the remaining 10 tributes to make their way back to the cornucopia. Claude immediately decided to run back to the cornucopia, but Valor immediately grabbed him and told him that there would be several bigger threats back at the cornucopia. Claude began panicking and asked Valor what they should do as they saw several rocks falling from the ceiling, but Valor told them that they could create a hole in the ground and hide. Claude continued panicking as he hacked at the ground with the axe, desperately trying to make some space. A sponsor immediately sent both of them giant chisels, which they used to continuously hack into the ground until there was enough space for both of them to hide inside. Valor climbed in first and Claude followed, before placing a large boulder above their hiding spot as more and more rocks fell as boulders rolled. However, a larger boulder knocked away the boulder covering their hull, making Claude scream as a rock hit him on the hand. Valor winced and held Claude back as another boulder covered their hull. Finally, the rock fall and boulder roll stopped with Valor and Claude trying to push the boulder away from their hole. After six of the remaining ten cannons sounded, Valor and Claude swung their chisels at the boulder, breaking it in a few hours. They climbed. They slowly climbed down, and Claude's hand, which had been hit by the rock, began bleeding, alerting the rats. However, Valor managed to cover the blood once more, and she and Claude decided to walk back to the cornucopia. On day f- 12, Watson from 5 was stabbed by Aegeus from 2, leaving just Aegeus, Claude, and Valor remaining. It was noticed by Rubius and Priscilla Price that although Valor could have easily killed Clot as he was one of her remaining two opponents, she did not, but as she slept, she failed to notice Clot was packing up his supplies and running away to hide in the cornucopia. She awoke on day 13 and saw many rats running towards her, making her jump, but she was even more surprised when she saw that Clot had gone. She ran towards the cornucopia, narrowly avoiding crossing pots at Aegeus, who had six axes in his belt. Meanwhile, Clot was hiding in the mouth of the cornucopia, and as Aegeus entered, Clot ran outside to confront him. 
The boys began a determined duel, with Clot easily bl- blocking all of Aegeus's attacks with his own axe. This fight lasted several minutes, and Valor climbed onto the Cornucopia Island, just as Aegeus narrowly managed to gain the upper hand on Clot. Rubius amazed by what n- was amazed by what an amazing fight Clot was putting on, but just as he was then stabbed in the stomach by Aegeus's axe, causing him to drop to the ground in pain as Aegeus scoffed in triumph. Age- as Clot's can. Aegeus de- announced himself as the victor as he arrogantly grabbed all of his axes and threw them at the wall in triumph. Clearly not realizing that Valor was angrily creeping up behind him, furious that he had fat- fatally injured Cloth. Aegeus finally heard Valor, but as he spun around, she slammed a rock into the side of his head, causing him to fall directly onto Cloth's axe. His cannon sounded and Valor ran towards Cloth, comforting him as he died, leaving her as the winner. Following her victory, Valor became a capital favorite, but she felt guilt about Claude's death. However, she became a part of capital circles and attended many parties, being the costume designer for various movies, including those about the lives of Salazar Gall and Richard Rickled Snow. She was also remembered fondly by the capital for the way she had used the diamonds present in the arena to kill other tributes. The 134th game took place in the year 156 in a golf course featuring lazy hippos, an oxygen drop, and lasting for nine days. The 134th game reminded capital viewers and future tributes that sometimes the arena can provide everything necessary for victory. This year's victor was a 15-year-old from District 3 named Silica Creens. Before the gong sounded, Selika was already looking around the arena for something that she could use to her advantage. After a few seconds, the gong sounded and Selika sprinted inwards, making her way towards the cornucopia as the first tributes began to die. Selika's district partner, a 16-year-old named Vizio, saw her and called out her name, before running towards her with a net and some rope he managed to seize. Vizio was then attacked by Pompano from four, but he managed to grab some metal wire from his pocket and he thrust it into Pompano's head, which managed to kill him almost instantly. Selica then helped Vizio up and they both fled the clearing, just as the careers took control of the cornucopia. Selica and Vizio were familiar with each other from their years of working together as programmers. Although both of them came off as arrogant about their skills of viewers, they were nevertheless favorites to win. The two of them spent the first three days of the games alternating between walking towards the perimeter and walking back to the cornucopia, and they noticed that the night lights would go on due to the golfers of old America having stayed up late to play golf. Silica and Vizio came to the realization that there had to be some kind of generator hidden in the arena in order to automatically turn on the lights at night. They tried to find a generator, with Vizio believing he could use the high amount of voltage in the generator to electrocute numerous tributes, while Silica argued that he could hack into the generator so that the lights would go not go on at night. They argued over whose idea was better and how many tributes they could kill, but Vizio soon stubbed his toe and they moved away several trees to reveal the generator. The pair continued arguing as soon as they found a generator, with Silica telling Vizio that he could not be sure he would not electrocute himself while reconnecting the circuits of the generator, whilst Vizio asked Silica in a sarcastic tone how she would be able to hack into the generator without a computer. They continued arguing and Vizio could be seen reaching for his wire, but after a few minutes a sponsor gift floated down to the pair. Silica opened it to see a computer and several wires attached to it, while there was also a note from their mentor, Corden Harper. Vizio read it, stating that it said they should not argue, as they were district partners from the smartest district. The pair finally stopped arguing, and Vizio helped Silica plug in the wires of the computer into the generator, and several lines of code immediately appeared on the screen. Silica adjusted her glasses as she glanced at the screen, slowly processing the codes. She then began typing extra lines, with Vizio appearing to be rather impressed by this, but Silica ignored his praise and continued working finally managing to hack into the generator, before grinning at Vizio and telling him to tell her when night fell and when tributes were approaching. Night soon fell and, like usual, the lights went on and Vizio turned to Silica before they hid behind the generator, with Silica still typing into her computer. A few minutes passed before the career decided to split up in order to hunt for other tributes, and Prodigy and Gold, both from one, made their way towards where Silica and Vizio were hiding, using the lights to navigate. As they came closer, Vizio whispered to Silica to hurry, and after a few seconds she grinned and typed one last command into the computer before the lights all around the arena went off. 
Prodigy and Gold shouted in confusion as Prodigy asked what was happening, but he suddenly saw the silhouette of Vizio approaching them. Prodigy turned to run, but Vizio drew his metal wire to the air, hitting Prodigy in the head and he collapsed to the ground, sounding his cannon. Golden screamed and asked who was there, but Silica stole a knife from Prodigy's body and used it to stab Gold. Silica and v- Vizio rejoiced at the success of their plan, and they quickly turned the lights back on as the hovercraft retrieved the bodies of Prodigy and Gold. Several other tributes decided to investigate this area, giving Silica and Vizio the time to kill more tributes. They continued with this strategy until they had eliminated 11 tributes, with Vizio stabbing 7 of the 11 with his wire and Silica killing the other 4 with her knife. However, on day 9, GameMaker Cardio announced that the oxygen levels in the arena would drop and that the only way for tributes to breed was to take a mask from the Carnacopia. Silica and Vizio agreed to leave the generator, but decided that as soon as they got their masks, they would run back here. It took them about 10 minutes to make it back to the Carnacopia. But instead of grabbing the masks, which had just risen from the ground and into the mud of the Carnacopia, they decided to stay hidden outside the clearing and make sure that the couriers were not there. However, Miller from 9 and Albina from 14 immediately ran past them to grab their masks, but just then the couriers jumped out from behind the Carnacopia and threw a barrage of knives at the pair. Miller was hit several times in the head and his cannon sounded, but Albina managed to get away with her mask. The other couriers immediately began chasing Albina, but Vizio thanked Silica and called her an amazing ally, telling her how to harness electricity from the generator. Silica and Vizio then grabbed her mask as Albina's cannon sounded after the couriers grabbed her and killed her. Because of this, the couriers turned on each other and after a fight, only Sia from four remained. Sia then grabbed her trident and her knives and searched for Silica and Vizio, her only remaining opponents, and she spotted them running from the cornucopia towards the generator. Sia gritted her teeth and sprinted towards them, making Vizio and Silica both shout in a panic. Vizio took a deep breath and told Silica to run to the generator, which was only a few meters away. Sia neared them and Vizio shouted at Silica to run, which he did. Vizio then ran towards Silica and Sia and shouted her name, making her grin. She launched her trident through the air and it impaled Vizio's chest, causing him to stagger back and sounding his cannon. Sia then asked herself where Silica was, not noticing that Silica had done what Vizio had told her and held a sharp wire in her hand and was creeping up behind Sia. Silica lunged the wire towards Sia and she shouted from the pain, but screamed even louder as all the current in the generator flowed into her body. Sia's screams grew louder and louder until Silica pushed her to the ground and her cannon sounded, leaving Silica as the victor of the 134th Hunger Games. Silica returned to District 3 following her victory and although she suffered several nightmares, mainly concerning Vizio's death and what she had done in the arena, her mentor Corden managed to comfort her and they became even better friends. She was also a popular victor like Corden and attended many parties and performances and shows with her friends in the capital, although she luckily distanced herself from alcohol. The 135th games of the year 157 were the 12th quinquennial quell. Although each quinquennial quell was heavily anticipated by capital viewers, the 135th Hunger Games, which took place 35 years after the Reconstruction era began, appeared to be much more anticipated by capital viewers and district citizens alike. All 34 former victors traveled to the capital, due to President Flickerman having asking them to ask them to come. Even some of the district victors, such as Optimo Braun, Magnus Plinth, Selena Larson, Oregon Luther, Ned Charles, Jin Green, Toe Blooper, and Delilah Undersea made their way to the capital, although they were not considered real victors by most of the others. After Flickerman went, Flickerman went on t- Capital TV a week before the games were due to begin, and he pushed back his white hair, and there was a pause of silence. Then, in order to remind Pan Am that the capital has always managed to keep peace when the districts start war, this year's tributes will be reaped from peacekeepers between the ages of 16 and 20, based on their home district. Outrage, outrage appeared in the districts where most peacekeepers were from districts 9, 10, 11, and 12. In other districts, peacekeepers roared in triumph. The loyal peacekeepers walked towards the protesting peacekeepers and dragged them into the building of justice of their district, before lecturing them about how they had chosen to serve Pan Am and how they would now be representing Pan Am in these games. Within a few minutes of this quilt was being announced, the extremely popular victor, Lucius Castro of the 105th Games, went on Capital TV and announced to Olive Panem that his 16-year-old son, Julianus, who was a peacekeeper in training in District 8, would be volunteering this year. 
The camera moved to District 8, where Julianus had ripped off his helmet and was being congratulated by his peacekeeper mates. Julianus was immediately taken to District 2 by means of hovercraft, with his mates still cheering out his name. The reaping games of District 2 took place a week later, and Julianus performed well, just like Pan Am predicted, stabbing his knives through his opponent's rings, causing them to fall off. <clears throat> Julianus cheered out in pride as soon as he was announced as the male tribute of District 2, and he grinned at his father, who was on stage, beaming in pride. The reapings in the other districts were rather amusing, as most peacekeepers decided to volunteer for the games. None of them hesitated to show off their full skills during training, as most of them had trained in a training center like the ones the tributes had trained in before the games. Several tributes refused to take off their peacekeeper attire for the tribute parade, but they eventually decided to do so after non-tribute peacekeepers held them at gunpoint. Several of the peacekeepers came to the stage after the interviews and danced, which is unusual for the peacekeepers, but the tributes soon joined them. Needless to say, all of the tributes were very excited for the games to begin the next day, and they happily entered their launch rooms. Julianus was then visited by his father, who wished him the best of luck, but all of the tributes were surprised when they were blasted out of their tubes. This year's games took place in a space station, featuring murderous aliens, an asteroid attack, and lasting for 18 days. The tributes thought they were floating in space, and they glanced out of the windows directly beside their, their podiums, realizing that they were in fact floating in space. The sense limited the size of the arena, and it was one of the smallest arenas, being only two miles in length and one and a half miles in width. It was also noticed that the only available weapons were swords with blades that appeared to be lasers, dubbed lightsabers by Rubius Dalton and Priscilla Price. As soon as the gong sounded, chaos erupted as the five older, 20-year-old peacekeepers made their way towards the others, targeting the 16-year-olds. Despite districts 1 and 2 usually allying in the games, 20-year-old Raiden from 1 began chasing Julianus. Julianus lunged towards the lightsaber and managed to grab it just before Raiden could get it. Raiden grabbed his own lightsaber seconds later, and the young man had a rather fun fight. But Raiden was soon distracted by the other tributes, and Julianus managed to grab a bowl of soup. Julianus decided that he would explore the arena, believing that he could not trust his fellow careers this year. He nearly encountered the careers, who were all working alone, but failed to interact with them. Whilst following Sonic and Picard, both from Tree, during the early hours of Day 5, he saw that they argued a lot over who was the better peacekeeper, after they had had an argument in District 9, where they had both been stationed. Julianus easily crept up behind him and used his lightsaber for the first time, slamming it through Picard's neck and accidentally slicing it into Sonic's torso, which caused her upper half to fall off. He also managed to kill Ticket and from Seven and Quilty from Eight with his lightsaber on the next day. Even Julianus' father described him as quite a hider for a career, but Julianus had been trained to be able to hide in District 8, where morphling deals and crime were common. On day 9, however, he ran into Victor from 14, who immediately attacked him with his lightsaber. Julianus managed to put up a strong fight against Victor, even stabbing him in the hand with his lightsaber, but Victor managed to pull, pin Julianus to the ground through his intense pain, and he slowly tried to slit his throat with his lightsaber. Julianus desperately tried to fend off Victor, but Victor persisted until two of the careers arrived. Victor began a fight with Hudson from four and quickly killed him, but fled as Celia from two, Julianus's 20-year-old district partner, who was a peacekeeper in District 14, helped Julianus up and asked him if he was okay. Julianus scoffed in amusement and asked Celia why she was helping him. Celia replied and re said she was a peacekeeper and said, Peacekeepers are, but were staring expectantly at Julianus, and he said, honorable and loyal. Celia grinned at Julianus and told him that she was loyal to the capital and to District 2, and so she would help Julianus. Although Julianus looked like he would reach for his lightsaber, Celia still asked if he would like to start an alliance, making Julianus grin, and he shook Celia's hand. The pair turned out to be great allies and shared different stories about their experiences as peacekeepers, with Celia acting as one of the three peacekeepers guarding the main farm in District 14, where all the unused mutations were kept before the games. Julianus laughed and told Celia that this made her an amazing ally, as she would be familiar with the mutts in the arena. Each night, the two of them would whisper the peacekeeper pledge to each other. On day 17, however, Julianus accidentally asked Celia if he could touch her braids, and he grinned at him awkwardly, but was saying that he could do so. However, just then, an asteroid slammed into the arena, causing it to roll over. 
Both Julianus and Celia shouted in fear as they were thrown around due to the asteroid. More asteroids hit the station and Celia accidentally sliced her hand off with her lightsaber. She screamed and Julianus turned around in gasped, but he was suddenly seized from behind by an alien. Julianus screamed as the alien tried to slash him with his claws. Julianus slammed his lightsaber into the alien's chest, but the alien rolled to the side and avoided this. Celia continued screaming as she shook on the ground, and Julianus finally managed to behead the alien before beginning to fight with another one. Julianus killed this one and then glanced at Celia, who told him to continue running. Julianus told her that he might be able to help her, making his father smack his head, but Celia shouted that she would die anyways and he might as well leave. Julianus took a deep breath and left Celia, who died from mass blood loss a few minutes later. That night, three more tributes died, and Julianus watched Horn of Plenty at midnight. It was then that he realized his only remaining opponents were Raiden, a peacekeeper from 1 who worked in 11, and Via from 12, who worked in District 1. Coincidentally, Via was one of the daughters of Sarah Wildwood, a former victor, and has caused several arguments between Sarah Wildwood and, and Lucius Castro. Exactly one and a half hours after Horn of Plenty was shown, Julianus was awoken by aliens, who started chasing him. Julianus ran back towards the center of the arena as asteroids started ch- ch- shaking the space station once more, making him scowl. He reached the center of the arena a few minutes later and was hit in the arm with a lightsaber that Raiden had just thrown. Raiden then ran towards the Julianus and spoke about how much he despised him for being a victor's son. But as Raiden was about to stab Julianus with his lightsaber, his head suddenly rolled forwards onto Julianus, and he looked up to see that Via had just beheaded Julian- Raiden. Julianus reached for his lightsaber and quickly stopped Via's attack, and they had a quick fight, although Julianus finally managed to stab Via in the chest before apologizing as she fell down the stairs and her cannon sounded. Following his victory, Julianus returned to District 2 as a hero, but then continued his peacekeeping training until he became a major and returned to District 8, performing several exploits and even nabbing a smuggling ring that had connections with rebels from District 14. All these rebels were later executed, much to the delight of President Flickerman, who awarded Julianus with a considerable amount of money. And that is the story of Corden Harper, Marius Crutes, Valor Tanner, Silica Creens, and Julianus Castro. I hope you enjoyed these games. I certainly enjoyed writing them, especially the last one, and it's one of my favorites, in fact. I hope you guys are ready for ne- for next month's games, which are going to be amazing, if you trust me. And, um, yeah, I really have nothing else to say. So, goodbye, Tributes. Your flight has just left Pan Am and back into the real world.